from the Virginia Tech. Um, Sarah did her PhD at IPM and Tehran, but actually she was at Campina State University where she did most of her research. And then she went on for postdocs at Sao Paulo University and is now at Virginia Tech. Uh, Sarah has been working a lot on neutrino physics and did some very interesting work there and how to constrain kind of effective field theory using neutrino experiments and how to look for sterile neutrinos and kind of non-standard interactions. And she will be telling us today about her work on effective field theory and basically how to constrain um, effective field theory from neutrino experiments. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's really a great honor to give a seminar from my home at the other side of the planet. It's so nice. So today I'm going to explain how we can uh, use the neutrino experiments to constrain new physics parameters uh, within the language of the effective field theory. Uh, so the work I'm going to talk about is mainly based on these three works we developed the formalism together with Adam Falkowski from uh, LPT Orsay and Martin Gonzalez from CERN and Valencia University. Uh, and then in this second paper together with Adam and Martin, we showed the application of this formalism at the reactor neutrino experiments, Diabay and Reno, and currently in a work which is in preparation together with Adam and Martin, as well as Joachim Kopp from CERN and Jotam Sorek from Technion University. Uh, we are showing, we are seeing what's the application at the phaser new experiment at LHC. So in this talk, I'm going to say why we want to study our new physics within the effective field theory language. I will talk about the properties of different EFTs at different energy scales. I will say how we can study these at the neutrino oscillation experiments and what's the application at the reactor experiments, Diabe and Reno, as well as, uh, as well as the phase there new experiment. And then for each case, I'm going to compare the constraints we get from our neutrino experiments with the constraints we can get from the non-oscillation experiments. And I'm going to conclude finally. So as you all know, at the standard model of particle physics, we don't have any right-handed neutrinos. So neutrinos are predicted to be completely massless. But we know from uh, several decades of many different neutrino experiments from the atmospheric solar, uh, from the reactor, as well as the accelerator experiments, uh, we know that neutrinos oscillate in nature. And in order to explain this oscillation, the neutrinos, they need to be massive and they need to mix. So the reason that neutrino oscillation happens is because the flavor eigenstates of neutrinos, which are the eigenstates related to the charged leptons, electron one and tau, and the mass eigenstates, which are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, they do not coincide with, with each other. However, they are related with each other through a unitary three by three matrix, the so-called PMS matrix. And so in order to have a non-zero oscillation, a non-zero probability oscillation at the distance L from the source, which is uh, imagine neutrinos with the flavor alpha are being produced at the source. And we want to see after a distance L, what's the probability that these neutrinos with the flavor alpha are oscillating with the neutrinos with the flavor of beta. This oscillation would be non-zero only if the elements of this PMS matrix are non-zero, and also if the uh, difference between the square of the neutrino masses, which is defined here, uh, this delta m square kj, they are non-zero. So in order to explain the oscillation, we need to have all these parameters. So the parameters which govern this neutrino oscillation are the parameters inside this PMS matrix, which are three mixing angles, theta 2, 3, theta 1, 3, and theta 1, 2, as well as one CP violating phase delta. delta. And as I said, we have uh, two uh, non-zero mass square differences, delta, the solar mass square difference, which is the difference between M2 square and M1 square, and the atmospheric mass square difference. We don't know what are the absolute neutrino masses. So for example, we don't know if the largest, not the largest mass is this M3 or this M3 is in fact the lightest mass. 
In case M3 is the largest mass, then the difference between this M3 square and M2 square would give this uh, atmospheric mass square difference. And we call this case the normal ordering. And if M3 is the lightest one, this atmospheric mass square difference would be the difference between the square of M1 and M3. And so this would be negative and it gives us the inverted order. So how can we study these parameters from the solar as well as the long baseline reactor experiments like Camlan, we can get constraints on theta one two mixing angle as well as the solar mass square difference. The medium baseline reactor experiments like Diabe, Rina and double shoe they give constraints on the theta one three mixing angle, while the atmospheric experiments like Ice Cube, Super Kamikande, and also the accelerator experiments, C2K, Minus, and Nova, they constrain theta two three, the atmospheric mass square difference, as well as the uh, CP violating phase. And as you see, we don't have any information on what are the absolute neutrino masses or what's the nature of the neutrinos uh, from the neutrino oscillation experiments. What do we know from all these oscillation experiments? We already know what are the values of theta 1, 2, theta 2, 3, and theta 1, 3 with a very good accuracy. Uh, we also know the solar mass square difference, which is positive by definition, and we know the absolute value of the atmospheric mass square difference. We still don't know if we have the normal ordering, so if this delta mass square 3 L is positive, or if we have the inverted ordering, we also still don't know the value of the CP phase. We don't know if we have a CP, con CP conserving case. So this delta CP would be 188 degrees or if we have a CP violation case. So although there are parameters at the neutrino sector that we don't know them very well, we've had almost 30 years of, uh, 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 of taking data from the neutrino experiments. So we think this is time that the we consider all these oscillation experiments as a part of a broader program and we do some precession measurements or uh, we, we try to get information on the parameters of some new physics in a more systematic way. The reason we can do this is because the neutrino oscillation experiments, they are, they are not only sensitive to the neutrino masses and mixings that I mentioned earlier, but they are also sensitive to how neutrinos interact with matter. So if we have new four fermion interactions between neutrinos and charged leptons, as well as uh, quarks, so or neutrinos and other fermions, uh, then in principle, these four fermion interactions, they can affect the production, detection, and propagation of neutrinos. And so they could give some observable effects. And so we can use the neutrino experiments to systematically study this. Then we want to see how can we do this within a systematic language and effective filtering like language to get as much information as we can on the parameters of the beyond the standard model. We want to do this using the effective filtering language, starting from uh, uh, the Lagrangian using the quantum filtering approach, because in this way, uh, we can probe several different low energy observables within the same consistent framework. And for example, when we get constraints from neutrino experiments, then we can compare these constraints with several other experiments like LHC, like beta decay experiments. And so we can compare all these constraints in a more meaningful way. And we can have a feeling if we see some effect of new physics where we should look for the new physics. So uh, uh, if when we get these constraints, then we can also translate them to some UV complete scenarios. So indirectly, again, we can, uh, we can um, see what order of uh, new physics we can get sense of. But the main message here is uh, that the new physics could be most probably at a scale much larger than the Z boson mass, which could be at a scale that even very high energy colliders are unable to reach to that scale. But within the effective filtering language, we can use our low energy experiments, like for example, the neutrino experiments to indirectly constrain the parameters of a very high energy theory. How can we do this? The point here is that the relevant effective filtering at a scale much smaller than the Z boson mass 
which is the scale of most of our neutrino experiments, the relevant theory is the weak effective field theory. Uh, so using the neutrino experiments, we can get constraints on the parameters of this weft. Now, when we get the constraints on weft, we can match this weft to the SMEF, which is the standard model effective field theory, which is the uh, relevant theory when the, when the scale of new physics is much larger than the Z boson mass. These two theories are related to each other at the Z boson mass. So we get constraints on weft, we match them with the ones at the SMEF. So indirectly, we get constraints on SMEF from the neutrino experiments. And when we have these constraints, we can then translate them on several different beyond the standard models. This is, of course, if we assume that uh, a more complete theory is this SMEF one, or if the new physics is at a scale much larger than the Z boson mass. This doesn't have to be, of course, the case. The new physics could appear at a scale much smaller than the Z boson mass, or this weft theory could be complete by itself, which in this case, whatever constraints we get on weft from the neutrino experiments, they could be directly uh, translated to a specific beyond the standard models. So let me tell you uh, about these effective field theories. The standard model effective field theory, which as I said, is the EFT at a scale much above the Z boson mass, it has the exact same particle content and local symmetry as the standard model. So the SMEF Lagrangian is the standard model Lagrangian. The difference is now we allow to add higher dimensional non-renormalizable operators to the Lagrangian. At the last order, we have this dimension five operators, then we have dimension six operators and so on. The effect of having these uh, higher non-renormalizable, uh, uh, higher dimensional non-renormalizable operators is that now the standard model gauge boson vertices like the W boson vertex with the standard model fermions, this would be modified. Uh, apart from this, we will have new four fermion interactions added uh, to our theory. At the last order, as I said, uh, we have dimension five operator, but this is the Weinberg operator and it only gives masses to neutrinos, which at all these experiments, these, uh, these are uh, negligible. So at the last order, we consider the dimension six operators. At the scale, uh, much smaller than the Z boson mass, the relevant theory is the weak effective field theory this weft has the same Fermi-like interaction between uh, the standard model uh, uh, particles like neutrino charged leptons and up and down type quarks. For the standard model, we just have this term. Now in addition to the new physics, we have a left-handed like interaction, which is, has the same interaction, but with just a different, uh, uh, different uh, co effective coefficient here. Uh, and then in addition, we have new right-handed scalar, pseudo-scalar and tensor interactions added uh, to our Lagrangian. So the goal is to see what constraints we can get on all these uh, five three by three matrices that we have here from the neutrino experiments. Then we get constraints on these epsilons, we translate them to the ones of SMEF and so we can uh, we can constrain new physics uh, models. But how can we match this weft and SMEF theory? In principle, we can get the same Lagrangian if we integrate if we integrate out all the heavy particles from this SMEF. So when we integrate out Higgs, Z, and W bosons as well as the top quark, and we match the two Lagrangian, we can see what is the relation between these epsilons and the Wilson coefficients of these uh, higher dimensional non-renormalizable operators. And here is the matching. So if we get the constraints on these epsilons, we have the constraints on all these Wilson coefficients from our SMEF. Uh, there are just two things to note here. 
Uh, starting at the level of Lagrangian, we see uh, at the lowest order with respect to perturbation, that is at the order of uh, uh, dimension six operators, uh, we see that all the five interactions are present at the same time. So all of them are present at the same time at the order of lambda uh, to the minus two. Secondly, while for all the left-handed scalar, pseudo-scalar and tensor interactions, when we do this matching, in principle, all the three nine elements of these, uh, all the nine elements of these uh, three by three matrices are zero. So all the diagonal and off diagonal elements of these are non-zero. For only the right-handed interaction, we only have diagonal elements once we do the matching with this map. We don't have to worry about this if we just care about weft and we forget about this map. But otherwise, because these right-handed interactions are coming uh, because of integ integrating all the W bosons, which uh, uh, which uh, connect to all the charged leptons universally. So in principle, uh, uh, we can have like off-diagonal elements for these right-handed interactions. So then you could ask, how could we study such theory at the neutrino experiments? Imagine that the neutrino is produced at the source S uh, together with some charged leptons E alpha and some secondary particles S prime. These neutrinos from the source, they travel a distance L, they hit a detector T, they produce some uh, charged leptons E beta together with some secondary particles T prime. The, uh, uh, the processes uh, which describe this production and detection of neutrinos uh, can be described by the matrix elements. Uh, so uh, at the uh, uh, when we only have the standard model, the left-handed interaction, these matrix elements are only the PMNS elements as well as the, these amplitudes which only depends on uh, the kinematics and the spin variables of neutrinos. And in principle, uh, they could be a function of the neutrino energy or other kinematics related parameters. When we add the new physics interactions on top of them, these uh, uh, matrix elements are now proportional to also the epsilons, as well as the uh, amplitudes of each new physics interaction. So in principle, because the amplitudes are different, uh, we have different energy or kinematics dependencies here. What would be the observable at the neutrino experiments? Of course, the observable is the rate of the detected events. We want to see uh, a starting uh, from the Lagrangian, what would be the effect on the production of neutrinos here, as well as on the detection of neutrinos here. This uh, differential rate of uh, the expected events at the detector, it's proportional to the flux of the neutrinos coming from this source. It depends on the uh, detection cross-section at the target, and it also depends on the oscillation of neutrinos from the source to the target. For the standard model, this differential rate is the same as the standard model flux the standard model cross-section and the oscillation probability that I was showing you earlier, which depends on these mass squared differences as well as the elements of the PMS matrix. Now, when we add our new physics, apart from uh, these elements of the uh, PMNS, now we have new terms added on top of that. So at the leading order, we have terms like epsilon times two powers of u, and then at the quadratic order, we have either epsilon S square here or from production times the detection, we could also have uh, quadratic orders of the order of uh, with respect to the epsilon. But we want to see how we can get constraints on these epsilons. And in order to do that, we have to see what are these production and detection coefficients that we have at both the leading order as well as the quadratic order. These production and detection coefficients are the informations which come from the process dependent amplitudes. And they are defined as the ratio between uh, the interference between if it's a lead at the leading linear order with respect to epsilon. That's the interference between the uh, standard model amplitude and the new physics amplitude 
uh, once we phase we integrate over the whole phase space and we normalize it with the standard model amplitude square or if we have the quadratic order that is the interference between two different new physics like right-handed and tensor or the amplitude square of the new physics. So in order to see uh, what uh, kind of epsilon we can get, we have to see what are these production and detection coefficients that they depend on, uh, on our kinematics and our spin variables. So they are process dependent, of course. So to see what are those, I try to explain one by one some of these production and detection coefficients that we know. So once we have them, we can calculate the expected number of events, compare with the experimental data, and we see what uh, we can get on these epsilons. Let me start from uh, the reactor experiments, the detection which is done through the inverse beta decay which we know this process very well within the standard model, and it's very easy to add new physics on top of that. Uh, for the inverse beta decay, decay, the electron antineutrinos, which they are produced at the reactor cores, they travel to the detector, which is usually at a distance between 500 meter to 1500 meter from, uh, the detect from the reactors. They hit the protons uh, at the uh, detectors, they produce some positrons, that these positrons would be annihilated and they will produce a pair of photons. And they also produce a neutron, that these neutrons would be then thermally captured. They will also produce uh, some photons. And the time delay between the, uh, the photons produced from the annihilation of positron and the thermally capture, uh, capture of neutron is the signature of the inverse beta decay. We know it very well within the standard model, and it's very easy to add new physics on top of that. We see that these detection coefficients, they depend uh, on the nuclear couplings, the axial scalar, pseudo-scalar, and tensor couplings, that we fix them from uh, the lattice and theoretical considerations, so they are constants. But it's very interesting to see that for the scalar and tensor new physics, these coefficients, they are not constant, but they depend on the neutrino energy. And because of this dependence on the neutrino energy, we can see a lot of interesting consequences. Uh, the pseudo-scalar new physics is zero. So from the inverse beta decay, we can get any information on the pseudo-scalar new physics. The right-handed one is constant, and the left-handed one is one by definition, because it's the ratio between the ability to the square of the standard model. And so it's one uh, a standard model and a standard model. So it's one by definition. Uh, these are all uh, at the linear order with respect to epsilon. So these detection coefficients are, uh, we get them from the interference between new physics and the standard model. We could go to the quadratic order and until the end of the talk, I will, uh, uh, I will show in many different places why it's very important to consider all these quadratic uh, orders with respect to epsilon. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me just start from here that uh, when uh, we consider the quadratic order with respect to epsilon, the, these detection coefficients for uh, both a scalar and tensor, they don't depend on the neutrino energy anymore, but at the quadratic order, which is the amplitude square of the scalar and tensor new physics, they are constants and they just depend on these nuclear, nuclear couplings. For the right-handed one, it's one again. Uh, the production of neutrinos at the reactor experiment, it, experiment it's done through uh, hundreds of different beta decay processes. We don't know these processes very well, even at the standard model, because many different forbidden decays could be involved that we don't know them very well. But we know that at least 70% of these processes are done through the Gamow-Teller type uh, interactions. So again, we can calculate what are the production coefficients for these processes, uh, assuming everything is gamma stellar. We don't have any sensitivity to the pseudo-scalar and a scalar new physics. The right-handed coefficient is minus one. Uh, the left-handed one is one again by definition. But for the tensor new physics, we have a sensitivity on the neutrino energy again through uh, this tensor form factor.
These are for the linear orders with respect to epsilon. At the quadratic order, we again have the right-handed and tensor new physics, which are constant. They don't depend on the neutrino energy anymore. So how do the observables then change at, uh, for example, the reactor experiments that these production and detection coefficients are the relevant processes here? Uh, at the reactor experiments, the survival probability, which is the probability that we produce electron antineutrinos at the source, and uh, we see that if some oscillation happens after a distance L, how many fewer electron antineutrinos we have. So this survival probability, it's proportional to this atmospheric mass square difference, delta m square 3, 1, and the theta 1, 3 mixing angle. We see that if we want to study a standard model like new physics, so uh, a left-handed new physics, where the effect would be reabsorbed into a redefinition of this theta 1, 3 mixing angle. So these, uh, these L and then after this, all the other S, P, and T, they are defined uh, together with some um, off-diagonal elements of these epsilon uh, L or later S, P, and T, uh, 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 a superposition of epsilon emu and epsilon eta. And because uh, the production coefficients here uh, uh, for both production and detection coefficients for the left-handed new physics, it's one by definition. They don't depend on the neutrino energy. So all of this could be reabsorbed into a redefinition of theta one three. So because of this, these experiments cannot distinguish between uh, the standard model value of theta one three or if it's coming from a new physics. In order to distinguish them, we have to have some experiments which would be sensitive to a different combinations of theta one three and other parameters, but the reactor experiments cannot do that. This was also shown in this earlier paper by Tommy Olson and company. So the reactor experiments, they cannot be sensitive to the standard model like new physics, but they are sensitive to specifically the scalar and tensor new physics. And that is because that energy dependence that we had at the linear order, so here we just stick to the linear order, that energy dependence uh, doesn't allow, it, allow us to reabsorb all these uh, uh, scalar and tensor new physics into a redefinition of theta 1, 3. So uh, the, uh, the real parts of these uh, parameters, they, they give some energy dependence on these arguments of this sine square 2 theta 1, 3. And also the imaginary parts, they add the CP violating term uh, into our survival probability. So because of this energy dependence here, we will be able to constrain uh, the tensor and a scalar new physics here. So to show you uh, schematically what's the effect of this kind of uh, new physics, in the left-hand side, I'm showing the case for a scalar, and in the right-hand side, the case of tensor. In the, uh, in the vertical axis, I'm showing you the ratio between the survival probability we expect to see at a far detector for these uh, experiments, which is usually at a distance of 1500 meters. And we expect to see the oscillation at those far detectors over the, the uh, survival probability for the near detector, which is usually at a few hundred meter. And we don't see much of oscillation here. And um, I'm showing you this ratio because uh, these reactor experiments, they are sensitive to the ratio of the number of events between uh, the far and near detectors. So we see that if we turn on the uh, scalar new physics or tensor new physics compared to the standard model ones, which are uh, these orange curves, we have both the shift into the amplitudes and we also have uh, some distortion into the uh, neutrino energy. And it's because of this distortion, which we see it's uh, larger for the tensor new physics, uh, we expect to have sensitivity to these parameters. And also because, again, this is larger for new physics and for a smaller value of this imaginary and real of these tensor parameters compared to the scalar case, uh, we expect to be more sensitive to the tensor new physics. 
uh, compared to the scalar new physics at these experiments. So the reactor experiments that we consider here are the medium baseline reactor experiments, Diabay and Reno. The Diabay experiment, it consists of six reactor cores, uh, which uh, produce uh, a, a huge flux of electron antineutrinos. It has eight antineutrino detectors. Uh, four of these antineutrino detectors are at a distance of a few hundred meter from our reactor core, so they are our uh, near detectors, and four of them are at a distance of almost 1600 meters from the cores, and they are all our far detectors. And so at a, a lifetime of almost 2000 days, uh, the experiment has observed almost 4 million uh, antineutrino events. Uh, uh, and it was taking data until a few months ago, but it was uh, shut down a few months ago. Uh, the Reno experiment is very similar. It has six reactor cores, but uh, so it has more or less the same uh, uh, flux of electron antineutrinos, but it has only one near, near detector, which is a few hundred meters from the sources, from uh, the source, and uh, a far detector, which is almost 1400 meters from the source. And so, in an almost similar lifetime of the experiment, it has, it has observed 1 million antineutrino events. So uh, we expect uh, the Diabe experiment to be the dominant experiment, which gives constraints on our uh, new physics parameters. So on this tensor new physics, uh, uh, the reactor experiments can get, give a sensitivity of the order of 10 to the minus 2. I really do apologize for my cat. I'm so sorry about the noise. Uh, so for the tensor new physics, we get constraints of the order of 10 to the minus 2 from these experiments. On the scalar new physics, the constraint is weaker. It's of the, of the order of 10 to the minus uh, uh, 1. We can again see what's the constraint on the right-handed new physics. Just to remind you that these S, R, P, and T parameters, they are a, a superposition of epsilon e mu and epsilon eta. And as I mentioned uh, some uh, slides ago, for the right-handed new physics, once we do the matching with the SMEF, uh, we don't have any off-diagonal elements for uh, the epsilons. Uh, so uh, it's meaningful to get constraints on the off-diagonal epsilon R only if we don't care about the matching with the SMF theory and we assume that our new physics is at the low energy. And, but in this case, anyway, we get constraints also of the order of 10 to the minus two on these right-handed type interaction. So let me compare these results with uh, the constraints we get on the same parameters, but from non-oscillation experiments. But first, it's important to notice that from the reactor experiments, from the oscillation experiments, we can uh, be sensitive to these parameters at the linear order. And we can also differentiate between the real and imaginary parts of these epsilons. While these non-oscillation uh, uh, experiments, they are only sensitive uh, on the absolute values of the epsilons square. Uh, so they cannot differentiate between the real and imaginary parts. Also, the dependence on, uh, from these experiments, it comes at the order of lambda to the minus 4 in the SMEF expansion, which means that if we consider dimension 8 SMEF operators on top of dimension 6 ones, some of the effects could cancel each other. And so the bonds coming from non-oscillation uh, experiments on these set of sets of parameters they are not as robust as uh, the ones from neutrino oscillations. But all in all, we see that from nuclear and beta experiments, we can get constraints of the order of 10 to the minus 2 on the scalar and tensor new physics. This is one of the most interesting part ones because for a long time in the neutrino literature, it was assumed that these reactor experiments, Diabe and Reno, they cannot uh, be very much sensitive to the scalar and tensor new physics compared to the neutron and nuclear beta decays, uh, because the assumption was all these experiments can constrain these parameters much, 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 a lot stronger. But because 
We see that when we start at the level of Lagrangian, we are only sensitive to the octagonal elements of these, uh, these uh, interactions at these experiments when we compare with the constraint on the octagonal ones coming from the neutron and nuclear beta decays, they are of the same order. The same experiments, they can also uh, give constraints on the scalar interaction, this time through the CKM unitarity, which is again of the order of 10 to the minus two. The LHC can also give constraints on the absolute value of this scalar and tensor new physics through the Derelion processes. The constraints are of the order of 10 to the minus three, but as it was shown in this uh, paper by Gupta et al, uh, if one considers dimension eight operators, again, all of these could, uh, all these constraints could be weaker. The very strong constraint here comes from charge lepton flavor violation, like for, for example, from moon to electron uh, conversions. But these constraints are only uh, can be applied into the SMEF, the SMEF operators. So from these processes, we get constraints on the SMEF operators then using the matching that I mentioned earlier between SMEF and WEFT parameters, we can see what are the constraints on our WEFT operators. And we see that the constraint is very strong. It's of the order of 10 to the minus six, for example, on the, epsilon, on the scalar one, epsilon emu. But again, if we forget about the matching between the WEFT and SMEF, then the constraint uh, goes away. So let me just emphasize here uh, uh, that uh, we are not trying to say that from neutrino oscillation experiments, we get the strongest constraints on these parameters. What we are trying to do is how we uh, get constraints in a, in a systematic way. So then we can compare those constraints with other experiments like charge lepton flavor violation, for example. So let me move on uh, to the next set of experiments that we consider, which is the phaser no experiment. This case, uh, in our own opinion, is a lot more interesting. The phaser no experiment is a part of the phaser main detector, uh, which is an experiment which is already approved to be built at LHC. The phaser main detector is approved. The phaser new experiment is uh, uh, is still under a study, but it's most probably it's going to be approved. The phaser new part of the detector is supposed to detect the very high energy neutrinos, which are coming from uh, LHC. It's uh, at a distance of almost 500 meter from uh, the Atlas interaction point. Uh, it has 1.2 tons of the tungsten material, uh, it consists of emulsion plate. And because of that, the detector is able to detect not only electron ammon neutrinos coming uh, from LHC, but also the tau neutrinos we get uh, uh, to the detector. Why is it very interesting to consider the phaser no experiment? Because the detection process at this experiment is done through the deep elastic scattering uh, uh, because the energy relevant here is between 100 GV and almost 10 to the 4 GV. We are not sensitive to quasi-elastic and resonances cross-sections anymore, which are a lot more complicated to consider compared to the deep elastic case. Uh, and they are the relevant processes at Dune, Minus, Nova, those kind of experiments. And so because of this, uh, this energy uh, range, it makes it perfect to study new physics at the uh, detection site through the deep elastic scattering. It is interesting to see that when we uh, calculate the detection coefficients at the deep inelastic scattering, at the linear order, these detection coefficients are almost zero. The reason is that the interference between these deep inelastic scattering processes and the standard model one, they are proportional to the masses of up and down or C and S quarks and they are completely negligible compared uh, to uh, the neutrino energy here. So at the linear order, we don't have any sensitivity to new physics here. However, we see that at the quadratic order, these detection coefficients, they are not so small. 
for the right-handed and tensor uh, uh, new physics, for example. So these are the amplitude square of the right-handed and tensor new physics. They are of the order of even 10 or one. Uh, and so we can be sensitive to uh, the new physics, a right-handed and tensor new physics here. Just let me remind you when we have this, uh, uh, this detection of production coefficients at the quadratic order, it's being multiplied by also uh, epsilon square in front of it. So although at the linear order we have nothing, so we are not sensitive at all to uh, uh, the linear order with respect to epsilons here, at the quadratic order we have some sensitivity. This is only at the detection side. At the production side, uh, side things are a lot more interesting. Because as I said, uh, these neutrinos are the neutrinos produced at LHC. So many different charge and neutral mesons and hadrons are involved into the production of all the different flavors of neutrinos. For example, the electron uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos, it's uh, uh, mainly being produced from k on decays. The moon neutrinos, the main contribution comes from pion decay, and also the tau neutrinos, it comes mainly from the charm decay. And so we have all the different uh, flavors of neutrinos and antineutrinos at these experiments. And also we see that we have uh, tens of thousands of moon neutrinos, uh, almost Mm, thousands of electron neutrinos, as well as something like after all the uh, uh, geometrical cuts and uh, considering all the reconstructed vertices, we expect to have of the order of 17 tau neutrinos at the detector. At the standard model, uh, these neutrinos, they do not convert to each other at the distance relevant to this experiment. But uh, because of our new physics, then all these different flavors could convert to each other. So we expect to have 17 neutrinos, but because of new physics, a lot of these moon neutrinos or electron neutrinos, they could convert to tau neutrinos or the moon neutrinos could convert to electron neutrinos. And at then at the detector, if we have some new physics, we expect to see a lot of less or more of the neutrinos we were expecting. So this could indi indicate uh, the, uh, the presence of some new physics. And also because we have all the three flavors available at the same time, uh, because of that, we can probe all the elements, diagonal and off-diagonal elements of our epsilon matrices simultaneously. So the kind of the production coefficient that we can, uh, we can study from the pion decay are the left-handed, right-handed, as well as the pseudo-scalar new physics. The left-handed and right-handed ones, they are one and minus one, but the pseudo-scalar production coefficient, it's, uh, it depends on the uh, uh, masses of the mother and daughter particles it doesn't depend on the uh, energy of the neutrino, but it's a large number. This is at the linear order. And again, to remind you, this coefficient, it's being multiplied by epsilon. So because this uh, production coefficient is large and we have this chiral enhancement here, we expect to be a lot more sensitive to the pseudo-scalar new physics. At the quadratic order, we have uh, the same situation. We don't have a sensitivity to the neutrino energy, but at the quadratic order, this production coefficient is exactly the square of, uh, of the same production coefficient at the linear order. So this production coefficient at the quadratic order is very large. Here we had P times epsilon. Here we have uh, this uh, PPP uh, multiplied by epsilon square, and both terms are of the same order. So we are not allowed to cut uh, uh, our, our um, uh, perturbation at order of uh, uh, just epsilon. We have to con continue to higher order because they are of the same order. Uh, this is for the pion decay. For the kion decay, the situation is a bit more involved because we have both leptonic and semi-leptonic decays at the same time. Again, we can calculate these production coefficients, but this time in order to calculate them, 
we need the energy distribution of all the different kaons involved of the k plus minus k long and k short this information was provided to us by the collaboration and having that we can see uh, how uh, we are sensitive to the production coefficients from k on dk uh, we see that uh, as expected for the pseudo scalar new physics we have a very large sensitivity at the linear order, it's of the order of 20. At the quadratic order, it, it's of the order of a few hundred. Also for the right-handed one, it's uh, a bit smaller than one. Uh, these are all coming from the two-body decay part of the k on decay. Uh, for the three-body decay part, we have sensitivity to the scalar as well as uh, tensor new physics, but depending going higher to the neutrino energy, they become more and more suppressed. I forgot to say at the beginning that this, these are the production coefficients of k on decaying to the muon neutrinos. For the k on decaying to electron neutrinos, we see a more interesting case because now, uh, just reminding you from here, we have the dependence on the, from the two body decay. We have the dependence on the inverse of the electron mass or moon mass, depending on the, the two body decays uh, to uh, electron neutrino or moon neutrino. And because the electron mass is uh, a lot smaller than the moon mass, so when we consider the decay into electron, the production coefficients are much, much, much larger. So at the leading order, it's of the order of 100 at higher energies. At the quadratic order, that's of the order of 10 to the minus 5. The other new physics are still suppressed, uh, but we can get some information from them. So the message here is that from both pion and kion decay, we have a very large sensitivity to the pseudo-scalar new physics, but we can get a lot of constraints on the other types of interaction as did this experiment from pion or kion or charm decay, which I didn't show the charm decay here because uh, the coefficients are not as large as here, uh, but as well as the, uh, the deep inelastic scattering. So the type of uh, new physics we can study here uh, is uh, in this way. Here I'm showing you the pseudo probability. I call it pseudo probability because even at a distance of L to the zero, because the detector is very close to the source, uh, we still can have a probability which is different from it. In fact, the reason that we have this is because we have uh, we are using the standard model flux and cross section, and we are putting all the rest of the information inside this pseudo probability. So at the linear order, we only have uh, production coefficients from k on and pi on decay, uh, which they can only be sent, we can only be sensitive to the diagonal parts of these epsilons, but we are also sensitive to the off diagonal parts of the epsilons at the quadratic order using both uh, the production coefficients the production coefficients as well as the detection coefficients. And because uh, uh, we have very large production and detection coefficients here, we still expect to have a reasonable constraint from these off diagonal epsilons, although they are at the quadratic order. Just let me briefly show you what we expect uh, to get as a number of events at the phaser new experiment for uh, different flavors for electron neutrinos, moon, and tau neutrinos. Uh, just to have a feeling on how we could be sensitive to each new physics, here I'm fixing all the epsilons uh, to 0.2 for uh, uh, both electron and moon case and to 10 to the minus one for the tau neutrino case. And we see that depending on which type of new physics we have right-handed scalar tensor or pseudo-scalar new physics uh, being coupled to different ups and down quarks, we can get less or more uh, uh, number of events at the detector. For the pseudo-scalar one, because the production coefficients are very large, uh, the difference from the standard model number of events is uh, too much that it's difficult uh, to show them at the same plane uh, when we use the same value that we use for the other new physics. Uh, for the tau neutrinos, we expect very few number of events for the standard model case. Uh, 
So uh, because of this here, schematically, I'm showing what we uh, expect at each pin of energy, but in reality for the analysis, we consider a total rate of tau neutrinos, in this case, for both the standard model and new physics, while for the electron and mon uh, neutrino cases, we do a pin by pin analysis. So here are the final results that I want to show you. For the right-handed uh, uh, new physics, which can be uh, which the uh, neutrinos and char charged leptons can be coupled to up and down quarks or U and S quarks or C and S quarks, we get constraints from pi on decay, K on decay, charm decay, as well as the deep elastic scatter in all cases. And the best constraints we can get on some of these uh, parameters are of the order of epsilon to the minus two. So these vertical axes here are the epsilon different uh, elements of epsilons that we have. The difference between these three are the different uh, uh, um, quarks which are connecting to the electrons, to uh, the charged leptons and neutrinos. Here on the horizontal axis, we have the scale of new physics we can get, which is uh, the ratio between the Higgs web and the root square of these epsilons that we get. And we see that with uh, the uh, a scale of 10 to the minus two sensitivity we can get on a lot of these parameters, it can translate onto a, a new physics dependence of the order of one TV. We can compare the constraints we can get on these parameters from uh, other experiments uh, like pi on decay, tau decay, k on decay, or in the uh, next cases, LHC, and we see that on a lot of the parameters, uh, the dependence is very similar to what we can get from the other experiments, while for some of the parameters, either we don't have a very robust constraint or no constraint at all, or uh, on the other side of the spectrum, we can get a constraint uh, much weaker than what already exists in the literature. This is the case for the right-handed interaction. The case for the scalar interaction is not that different. It, uh, here we only have uh, uh, the interaction between uh, leptons as well as uh, U and S quarks coming from uh, the K on decay. Again, the best constraint we can get is of the order of 10 to the minus two translating to one TV, but the constraints we can get from other experiments, K on DK or LHC, they are uh, a lot stronger. As I advertised many times, the uh, pseudo scalar case is the case we can get the best constraints. Uh, again, we have constraints on uh, up and down, you, and S as well as C and S quarks coming from pion, kion, and charm decay. The epsilons that we can get here are of the order of 10 to the minus three, translating to a scale to the new physics of the order of 10 TV. For the tensor new physics, it's similar to the right-handed and a scalar one. We get a mm, constraints of the order of 10 to the minus two, a new physics a scale of one TV. For some parameters, phase and can do better. For some other ones, LHC or other types of beta decay or meson decay experiments could do better. Just to conclude here in the last uh, two, three minutes, let me mention again why a study in this type of new physics within this effective field theory language, uh, starting from uh, using this quantum field theory description, and it's a nice thing to do. Traditionally, the way we, we study new physics at the neutrino experiments in the charge current part is uh, in this way that we don't care where the new physics is coming from. So we don't start at the level of Lagrangian, but we say uh, any new physics that can affect the, uh, the production and detection of neutrinos, the effect would be into um, not having pure flavor states anymore. So if, for example, we produce electron neutrinos at the experiment, because of this effective new physics that we have, we don't have a pure flavor state, a pure uh, state of electron neutrinos anymore, but we have a superposition of all different flavors. The same for the detector, uh, which is proportional to this effective epsilon s and epsilon d. 
Again, the observable is the rate of the detected events, which is the standard model flux, a standard model cross texture, as well as the oscillation probability, which this time instead of uh, the Wilson coefficient of wealth, which are proportional to those production and detection coefficients, we have this effective epsilon s and epsilon d. So then one could ask, can we start from this traditional approach, uh, from this quantum mechanics uh, non-standard interaction approach, and then can we validate uh, all these results from uh, the quantum filtering prescription? So the question is, is there a matching between these uh, epsilon s and epsilon d and the Wilson coefficients are of our web Lagrangian? And if there is a matching, does this matching hold at all orders uh, in perturbation? The answer to the first question is almost yes, almost because we can find a matching, but uh, there are some bots that I will talk about uh, in, in one moment. But uh, the main issue here is that this matching doesn't hold at all orders uh, in perturbation. It only holds at the uh, linear order. We can find the matching once we compare the observables. The observable should be the same, depending independent of what's the theory that we use to study the new physics. So by comparing the expected rate of the neutrinos at the detector using either the quantum mechanics approach or the QFT approach, we can find what's the match relation between this epsilon S and D and these Wilson coefficients of the WEF. As you see in the right hand side, we have this production and detection coefficients, which could depend on the neutrino energy, which is completely missing at the left hand side. To give more detail, we saw that for beta decay, inverse beta decay, and pion decay, we have a sensitivity to different uh, types of new physics. So we have different, a, a, a certain correlation between different interactions. Uh, while for some of them, we also have a sensitivity on the neutrino energy, which is completely missing if we just uh, start uh, from this uh, effective approach. But even more importantly, that matching doesn't hold beyond the linear order. And I showed uh, in many slides that it is important to consider nonlinear orders because we have a very huge chiral enhancement in many cases. And the reason is this production and detection coefficients, they are the interference between new physics and the standard model or the amplitude square. The matching holds if the amplitude square of uh, a new physics, for example, tensor tensor, uh, would be the same of uh, the interference between tensor and the standard model and tensor and the, uh, uh, like the interference square. Because for many cases at the linear order, we have that dependence on the neutrino energy while it was disappearing at the quadratic order. So this matching doesn't hold anymore. And to show you schematically, for example, at an experiment like Camland, if we use that matching and we calculate the expected rate uh, from the QFT and the one from quantum mechanics. Uh, once we increase the value of the epsilon, we see that uh, it could be we expect uh, up to like 30% more or less events at our detector if we just uh, consider the, uh, the traditional quantum mechanics approach. But so it is important to, to, to start from the Lagrangian, calculate all those production and detection coefficients in order to see how, what's the sensitivity we have on the new physics. But the complication is, in this case, uh, we have to study all different processes which produce or detect neutrinos. Uh, some of them we have already are already done. Some of them they are in process. We are doing for like, for example, quasi elastic and resonances. Once we can calculate all or as many as this production and detection coefficients, then we can uh, prepare uh, our toolbox, which is including all of these in a package like uh, a GLOBS package, which is uh, the package that neutrino experimentalists use. To, uh, to simulate data for the line baseline neutrino experiments. We can prepare a similar thing so all the experimentalists could use uh, directly. But 
this is a mess. This is very complicated to do all of them. So it's a working process, but this is how we should do in order to study new physics. That's all I wanted to talk about. So I, uh, I tried to say why in order to study new physics, uh, using the effective filter language at these experiments, we have to go for uh, this effective filter, how we can use our low energy neutrino experiments to get constraints on the high energy new physics at the reactor ones, the constraint we can get is of the order of a few percent, while at the phase new experiment at LHC, we can get constraints of the order of 10 to the minus three, which is almost 10 TV. Uh, and so, because we use this EFT language, then we can compare the constraints with the uh, non-oscillation experiments in a more meaningful way. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a very interesting, comprehensive talk on those. Thank you. Effective field theory. Um, we have time for questions. Who would like to start? Maybe I start us off. Um, so in the end, you showed that a comparison between uh, the QFT rate and the, um, or if you have those quantum mechanical NSI, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly mm -hmm. that. Page. Yeah. Um, is it, so if, if I look at it correct, uh, if I look at that figure at the bottom right, then it's mm -hmm. the QFT rate is always bigger compared to the- uh, No, it's that, for example, uh, this is a schematic by the way, because the values of epsilon I'm using here are very large. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is just that then this quantum mechanics approach, it's undermining the sensitivity to new physics, for <clears> example. <throat> it's something like that. It's just schematically showing that they would be different. That's the mm -hmm. message we want to give. Okay, that okay. number isn't that important. Okay, okay. That's not, it just looked like that the QFT rate would be, have the tendency oh, um, to, to be larger and never no, to be no, no, smaller. No, 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 I, uh, no, no, I didn't want to. Okay, okay, so that's just... Do you Bruce? mind going? Hi. Hi. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, do you mind going back to page 33? Sure. There was a discussion there that was. Yeah. Here? I, I'm sorry, I did not follow this discussion. Do you, oh, do you, sorry. Do, okay. Do you yeah, have sure. another go at it? Sure, sure. Or, so, or perhaps uh, let me have another go at it, is what I mean. Sure, sure, sure. So there was this earlier paper by Joachim Kopp, who is one of the leaders in the neutrino physics that, uh, so it's like a somehow big review of how, what, depending on which experiments we consider using this quantum mechanics traditional approach, what types of epsilons we can constrain. So from which experiment we can be more sensitive to what types of uh, epsilons. And the message it was from this paper, which is was widely used in the literature, was because the nuclear and uh, neutron beta decays, they are very sensitive to this uh, scalar and tensor new physics. Uh, we can't get constraints from the oscillation experiments. But what we saw was that then we start from the Lagrangian, we see the ones we are sensitive from the oscillation experiments are on the off-diagonal ones, epsilon e more, epsilon eta. And the constraints from the same experiments on epsilon e1 eta, they are not uh, as uh, as uh, as strong as they are on the diagonal ones. On the off diagonal ones, we get 10 to the minus two, which is not very different with what we get from oscillation experiments, which is also 10 to the minus two. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, so the the neutron and the beta decay experiments are still the most sensitive on the diagonal That's elements, right. which is the standard understanding. That's completely true. But if you yeah. go off diagonal, then, then the oscillation and other experiments are competitive. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so yeah. on the oscillation ones, uh, uh, for the reactor experiments, we are not sensitive on the diagonal ones at all. So that's why... Uh, uh, that is the wrong comparison if we say in that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? I have another one. Um, so you mentioned those LHC bonds. 
Mm -hmm. um, but, but those, of course, I, I guess you don't use that big effective theory, but you will probably use standard model EFT uh, to calculate them. So, so when you quote the limits, um, this one or on the phase one, probably. Um, I, I, I either, either is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So those here are basically. Those are first derived in standard model EFT and then translated to those that's, weak that's effective true, yeah. EFT. And so they, they are at a low scale or at, at, at what uh, scale do you always quote? The... Oh, so it's like uh, mm -hmm. at, for the SMEF, I don't remember the exact energy we use. So we get the constraints on SMEF once we run them down. I think it's mm -hmm. at 1 TV or 10 TV, but I'm not sure. Then yeah. we have the running. So Martin Gonzalez is the expert. He has many papers on that. He's calculate all the runnings. So we have the running to uh, the Z boson mass. We match mm -hmm. them uh, at the Z boson mass. We get the constraints on the weft ones. Then again, we run down from uh, the Z boson mass to 2 GV. So the constraints uh, here, I'm showing they are at 2 GV, but getting from the 10 TV, for example, as math ones. Oh, okay, okay. So they are basically translated down to yeah, 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 that's to, to yeah. GV, where yeah, you compare everything. Right. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, that's good. Let's actually, um, I'm seeing that uh, people have to leave also. Um, let, let's say we finish the official part. I would